Council work session for April 25th, 2022. And tonight on our agenda, we have one item. We are being paid a visit by ACRA and the Chamber to talk about destination management. Thank you so much for having us. I know we've had a couple of dates on the agenda, so really glad to be in front of you guys today. Um, and before I turn it over to Destination Think, I just want to acknowledge um, all of your participation who was able to participate in the engagement sessions, which we started last July, um, and particularly the Aspen community who showed up in spades um, for the resident survey, which really helped inform the outcome, outcome of this plan. So let me get up my air screen. Uh oh. Just when you think you know technology. Um, it should I was it kicked me out. <laughs> okay, in business. Um, without further ado, I will turn it over to William Bacher and Tyler Robinson, who are senior strategists with Destination Think, who was our third party contractor to facilitate this destination management plan process. Thank you, Eliza, and hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is William Bucker, and I am the chief strategist at Destination Think, uh, speaking to you from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I wasn't the lead strategist on this uh, on this project. Um, that uh, is a gentleman named Frank Kuipers. Uh, he lives in Antwerp, Europe, so it's uh, it's uh, a little bit late there. So we uh, we we thought we uh, we let him sleep. Um, Let's get into it so we have enough time for discussion. Um, what we're going to go through today is, um, you know, I'll set things up a little bit. Um, Tyler will then um, talk about the engagement and research findings, um, define the challenge, and then we'll hand it over to Eliza, who will talk about uh, the strategies that we have um, worked on together um, and where things are at with the execution. So. And so let's set things up. So on the next slide, um, you know, a little bit of background, you know, this destination management plan uh, was an initiative by ACRA. Um, they went through competitive process, um, hired us, Destination Think. Um, we are a consultancy and agency uh, that specializes in destination marketing. We work with uh, DMOs. Uh, all around the world, we work with places in Europe, um, North America, and um, Australia and the South Pacific, uh, specifically. Um, and this is really to look at creating resiliency in the community. Um, you know, to to really set things up well uh, or manage things well over time. Um, and the process is really um, designed to work, um, uh, deeply, um, uh, uh, deep engagement process with residents, um, and with, uh, businesses as well. Uh, and we will talk a little bit, uh, about that. So, um, we used, uh, you know, the following process and methodology, um, you know, um, doing a lot of research, um, looking at, uh, some potential options, picking an option and then creating the strategies. Um, the next step will then be uh, measuring uh, if we're actually getting there and, you know, then the process, um, you know, starts again to uh, measure and adjust if you like. So, um, 
What is destination management? Let's talk about that um, a little bit from a tourism and a DMO perspective. Uh, well, the United Nations World Tourism Organization or the, w the UNWTO, they define it as the coordinated management of all elements that make up a tourism destination. Um, and really that what that means is that, um, you know, it includes a deep level of collaboration and coordination with numerous stakeholders working towards a common vision um, and really thinking about uh, both the uh, the strength and the competitiveness of a destination, but also the sustainability. Um, and, you know, that means that we need to broaden the, um, uh, the definition of success, uh, which is typically measured in economic terms, uh, but also connecting that to um, quality of life of residents um environmental sustainability um and what have you you know because without that um if you lose your social license if you like um then it poses a uh, uh, enormous business risk uh, as well as some places um, um have discovered now um on the next slide how i would define it um looking a little bit about what destination marketing is uh, or how would i explain it i should actually say uh, what is destination marketing? Well, um, we're trying to sell uh, certain products, certain experiences on the top of this chart um, to a specific audience, uh, often defined as a target audience or a market segment. And we do that through communication. On the right side, you can see communicating experiences. Um, we do that through stories, right? We're telling each other wonderful stories um, about places, um, and, you know, those stories are told by numerous storytellers that could be the DMO, that could be tourism businesses, um, residents, visitors, you know, through a plethora of channels, because these days um, everybody um, is a storyteller and everybody has its own media platform, uh, whether it's through social media or through uh, more formal um, means of communication. So managing that process has become infinitely more complicated right um just look at instagram like a few inf instagram influences can you know create massive movement of people and and sometimes disruption so where dmos have traditionally focused on the right side of this chart by communicating experiences um, that shift is really um, moving to the left by developing experiences which means building brands, creating the right stories, um, and getting those to the right audience requires coordination and management uh, and development um, as well to really think about the destination experience and all the individual experiences that are part of it. So on the next slide, um, you know, how is this, um, you know, summarizing it, um, you know, a lot of visitor economies around the world have really developed organically, um, which means that the DMO's role has basically been, let's take an inventory um, of activities, what is here to do, what makes us unique, what makes us different, what makes us competitive, what makes us interesting, um, and then communicating that. Um, and, you know, that results in, in growth, either which happened organically, um, and then ultimately uh, we'll promote that again. And that has led to some challenges because that organic process hasn't always uh, resulted in um, um, the right type of growth and causing some challenges. So destination management is really focusing on um, developing uh, the experiences on the left side of the chart. Um, handing it over now, I think, you know, unless I forgot about a slide, no, um, to my um, colleague, Tyler. Take it away, Tyler. William. Um, so now that we've kind of set a bit of the context, we want to dive into some of the research and engagement findings so that we set the scene for you and, and show um, how we've kind of informed how we've uh, approached some of the strategies or end recommendations, starting with the research. And during this uh, desktop research, uh, we wanted to just highlight a few of these top level um, findings. Nothing here is going to be groundbreaking to you folks who are in this community day in and day out, but just uh, kind of setting the stage. Um, arts and culture are very important to Aspenites. Um, 
a small town character came up time and time again. Um, and uh, it was evident not only in the city planning, but in many uh, forms of strategic documents that are created are created in different parts of, of your community, um, that this was something to be protected. Um, of course, tourism uh, was a key driver of or is a key driver of Aspen's economy um, next to real estate and construction, which is also are, which are also booming areas. Um, Aspen is actively committed to environmental stewardship and preserving natural capital. It's understood um, um, by many that this is the backbone of the visitor economy and uh, a lot of what makes your community special. You benefit from public transit, but there's also room for improvement there, particularly in the area of transportation management. And the city struggles with um, urban growth and in migration challenges, particularly around COVID times. Um, and speaking of that, labor shortages uh, were another area that was affected by this. And of course, this isn't germane just to Aspen itself, um, but uh, being felt across the nation. And then we also conducted a survey as well. Um, there was almost 1300 respondents uh, and based on the size of your community, this, um, this was a really encouraging level of engagement. It actually allowed us to get to about a 99% confidence interval, um, which st stands out about uh, among uh, many of our clients. We were able to get uh, a really nice diverse range of respond to respondents as well across the dimensions of age, um, whether they lived in Aspen or just outside of Aspen and, uh, and also how long they've been living in Aspen. As we move on to um, some of the other survey questions, uh, we wanted to really pull out um in the in the eyes of aspenites what makes aspen aspen um and so some some key points were skiing mountain location the recreation lakes and rivers the way of life the history festivals events and climate and as we dove a little bit deeper um a few trends emerged um particularly around the level of tourism and its perception uh, within residents' eyes, and and how that uh, how there's a bit of a, a tension sometimes between the level of beauty that everyone is proud of, and yet that can attract a, a number of people um, to the area, which uh, which can have a little bit of friction sometimes. Um, another a couple of other things that were very top of mind as. Um, as we dove into folks sentiment um, was we we'd asked some some various statements and tried to get a sense of whether they agreed were neutral on this or disagreed um, so tourism in aspen makes me feel more connected with my community uh, primarily folks disagreed with this um, i have a voice in aspen's tourism development decisions we saw again that there's room for improvement here um, which 74% uh, disagreed. And so um, that informs some of our recommendations that you'll see further on in the presentation around uh, the ways in which engagement can be deeper and a little bit more holistic going forward. Um, increasing the number of visitors to Aspen improves the local economy. Uh, answers were spread across this, but of course, uh, people uh, recognize the, the positive economic impacts here. Um, tourism results in an increase in the cost of living and improves the local economy. Uh, this was overwhelming agreement. Uh, tourists in Aspen are a nuisance. Um, there's, there's a range of answers here again. Um, um, so obviously there is there is a little bit of friction here that needs to be addressed. Um, and again, we, we allude to this in, in some of our recommendations and strategies. And then tourism causes Aspen to be overcrowded. Um, there was a uh, fairly strong agreement in this as well. As we moved on to industry interviews, I just want to pull out a few key themes uh, that we were hearing from folks. Um, the first one being that the visitor profile in Aspen is changing. And some of this has uh, was catalyzed by COVID, of course, and the, the changing demographic of the, of the visitor that's uh, now predominantly visiting. Um, there are some 
uh, concerns that the, some of the visitors coming these days are a little bit less considerate and have greater expectations. Um, some attribute this to the uh, lack of international travel um, and that changing mix. Um, uh, that was their perception there. And then also the off-season is shrinking. So operators commented on how uh, there's not a whole lot of downtime uh, in between seasons. There's also a sense that, or a request around AFRA taking a bit of a stronger role in promoting responsible tourism, uh, making sure that there's uh, targeted promotion and that um, tourism growth is being handled proactively. And then third on this list is uh, a need to address capacity. So in a couple of different aspects, um, in terms of traffic, uh, in terms of new homes, um, there's more people living in Aspen year round. Of course, that puts that puts stress on infrastructure. This is another COVID um, theme. And then lack of staff accommodations um, has been a challenge for the visitor economy. Another few themes that emerged was um, a discussion around the balance between preserving the city's character and commercialization. Um, uh, with the increase in, in chain restaurants or the, the concentration of, of corporate ownership can sometimes be seen as a move uh, in a less authentic direction. Um, and then rent was seen as, as uh, quite high for local employees. Uh, there's a need identified around more visitor education and visitor experience training for businesses. Um, and then this is primarily so that um, business, the business community can really speak to the visitor experience and practically educate tourists um, and, of course, attract a visitor mix that um, values sustainability um, and respects the, the natural and cultural environment um, of Aspen. And the final theme um, around these inter industry interviews was incorporating DEI principles. So there was an acknowledgement that the middle class um, is being pushed out a bit of Aspen and um, stakeholders rec recommended taking a bit of an equity lens um, to how things move forward. And uh, another piece or uh, component of this would be making sure that um, promotion is in increasingly targeting a diverse audience. Town halls uh, were another area of engagement. Um, just to understand the sentiment uh, of visitor economy stakeholders. And again, you're gonna to start to see some, some, um, some overlap here as I continue on through, through this presentation because there was uh, common themes that arose with different segments of stakeholders. But again, um, staff shortage came up as a primary challenge, uh, followed closely by visitor pressure and social inequality. Um, there was a recognition that Aspen is inclusive and that any, anyone can experience nature and yet there can be a bit of a barrier to entry, especially when it comes to prices um, to get that access. Um, the current mood in terms of sentiment analysis is, is slightly pessimistic, slightly pessimistic leaning. Um, part of this is due to stakeholders feeling a little bit exhausted by, by tourism at the moment. Um, but they also acknowledge that they're they're lucky to be able to enjoy the beauty of Aspen as well. Um, and then finally, um, in addition to skiing and winter sports, uh, there is advocacy for Aspen being known uh, beyond that. So, um, and more emphasis on arts, arts and culture, uh, natural beauty, outdoor adventure, philanthropy, and thought leadership. Workshops um, were hosted with ACRA uh, Board of Directors and industry members, so a little bit of a mix in terms of stakeholders. Um, and there's uh, key discussions around uh, who the Aspen's ideal visitor would be. Um, and it, there's some consensus around that being defined as someone who stays more than one night, who wants to give back to the community, make a difference, and who appreciates Aspen for what it is. Visitor pressure, of course, was was brought up um, uh, and talking about how managing this pressure is very much tied to preserving the soul uh, of Aspen. Traffic congestion, again, uh, came up as a theme. Um, 
uh, and there's a recognition that this can be exacerbated by staff having to commute from down valley from ongoing construction uh, and, and certain pressure points like that and then there was um, there is quite the debate around year-round tourism as well and, and talking about the, the pros and cons of um, a shrinking um, off-season um, kind of giving people a break versus maximizing revenue potential um, and so yeah there's a there's a conversation around whether how much time is the right amount of time to rejuvenate between between seasons this slide um, talks about or kind of visually demonstrates um, a bit of the prioritization of solutions that were brainstormed or co-created with the group um, and so you have the top uh, section talking about promotion and then the bottom four quadrants um, talking about product potential improvements and solutions and the way we this informed the recommendations is that uh, when solutions were organized into the top right quadrant which is high urgency and high feasibility that's something that of course can be uh, tackled right away in terms of uh, a suggested timeline um, and then the recommendations or solutions that were in the quadrant of uh, high urgency but lower feasibility um, uh, those might have to be tackled uh, in partnership with um, other organizations um, or there might have to be an advocacy role um, associated with pursuing some of those types of actions uh, if they're a little bit harder for ACRA to pursue on its own and then the low urgency high feasibility domain um, indicated that maybe this isn't something that we tackle right away in terms of uh, a rollout of, of these types of solutions but it is certainly something that should be on the list um, in due course and finally um, some conclusions just to kind of distill our, our thoughts from the various types of engagement that i just described um, there's uh, room for acra to help manage resident expectations and visitor pressure um, this could come in the form of delivering high quality experiences to um, a smaller target market um, acknowledgement that uh, the visitor profile has shifted and therefore um, some vis visitor education um, is required to try to counteract some of those pressures um, the destination would definitely benefit from additional low impact tourism experiences as uh, to align with the, the mission of, of trying to make the visitor economy as, as sustainable as possible. This comes along with um, ACRA taking a larger role in facilitating responsible tourism in general and the various ways it can do that. Um, maintaining some downtime in the off season, finding that right balance um, is key. Um, and this will help reduce some of the friction and create a harmonious relationship between businesses, residents and visitors. Um, and then, of course, that uh, locals realize they have um, excellent services and many benefits from the visitor economy. Um, and yet, this doesn't necessarily grant the social license for unlimited growth. So trying to strike that balance again between, um, between all the needs of, of various stakeholders. And so with that, we, we move to framing up the challenges. And... Um, I want to leave a, lots of time for for the strategy itself and Eliza to dive into that. So I'm just going to move through these quickly and, and you'll recognize them from previous slides. This is really just a distillation, but it comes in the form of, of staff shortages, mountain migration and gentrification, visitor pressure, social inequality, transportation management, and lack of economic diversification. And with all that in mind, um, we see a way forward, and this plan proposes a way forward um, through purpose-built tourism. And that's what that means is utilizing destination management principles um, and not tackling every problem that the community is facing, but strategically leveraging the visitor economy to address some of these challenges and push back against some of these challenges with tourism-based solutions. Um, and in that, um making an informed decision around whether the visitor economy or ACRA in particular is leading partnering or advocating um, in various areas of change and uh, eliza will will get into that in more detail when we walk through the strategies 
Um, this is all about um, uh, creating a version of the visitor economy where all stakeholders are, are engaged. Um, uh, it's a democratic process and it's a process in which social, economic, environmental considerations um, all have weight um, in the decision-making process. And so, and, and, and at the end of the day, it's, it's about designing um, with intention um, and believing that, that the visitor economy can have a higher purpose um, in supporting the community and the natural environment around it. With that, I'll hand it over to Eliza and we'll dive into the strategy itself. Thanks, Tyler. Um, before we get into the strategy, does anybody have questions about that engagement process or? Okay, great. So the strategic framework, um, and again, this was informed by all of that engagement, identifies three pillars for the plan, which are addressing visitor pressure, enhancing the Aspen experience, and preserving small town character. And there are 11 strategies under those three pillars. Um, and because we are a little bit overachievers, we've started adding some into the preserve small town character pillar, which we'll get to later. Um, and I'll walk through um, all of these individually, but this gives a overview of these 11 strategies under the pillars and the phases that they're identified to go through. Um, this is a five-year plan, so we are not gonna try and knock everything out um, here and I think really important to note um, Tyler spoke to it but ACRA is not going to solve all of these um, challenges that Aspen faces in in um, a vacuum so that was really why we were mindful about who we selected for those stakeholder interviews so we, we had Sarah Ott speak on it we had John Peacock we have U.S. Forest Service the college um, so this is something that the plan belongs to the community and it will it really will take um, community lift to get it off the ground. So there are certain places that ACRA will lead in. There's other places where we are better fit as a partner or an advocate. Um, so the first strategy under addressing visitor pressure is really engaging in 360 degree feedback with residents and industry. So again, the residents showed up in large numbers for that resident survey and we wanna keep them engaged understand that we've heard them. ACRA as an organization is pretty good at speaking to business. So we're looking to broaden that and how can we continue to engage with community at the resident level and the visitors um, and also kind of get below that manager and owner level of business and really get to frontline employee. So how can we broaden our reach? And as you'll see throughout this plan, much will be informed by that kind of continuous feedback loop with um, this engagement strategy. The second one is enhancing visitor education. We do quite a bit in this space right now with the How To Campaign and Aspen Pledge, um, but we have an opportunity to kind of bring the Aspen Pledge back to the community and really enhance the work we're doing in this space just um, not only just for visitors, but as well for new residents. Um, because I think everybody has noticed that, you know, there has been an influx into town and there, there is a way to, that we can reach out and kind of welcome new residents into the fold um, by providing some of this information. We've also met with um, Philip Sapino and his team to talk about what the how-to campaign looks like um, in the STR outreach. So how can we provide and partner on getting that information out to that really important visitor demographic who's staying in the short-term rentals. A third one is addressing traffic and congestion issues. And no, this is not some place that ACRA can lead. Um, this is an advocacy role for us. Um, and really it's looking at how can we work with RAFTA and the elected officials transportation committee to advocate for free bus service from Aspen to Glenwood. Um, how can we look at improving the way hospital employees who are commuting from down Valley get to the hospital at a transfer station. Um, and also looking at how can we replace the loss of the ground transportation from Denver airport with the loss of the Colorado Mountain Express and Vail Mountain Express. So that's something that we're partnering with Snowmass Tourism and Aspen Skiing Company to see um, how we can fill that void. Um, preserving and regenerating the natural environment, of course, is really paramount to improving the um, overall Aspen experience, but also 
protecting our um, natural assets. So we are partnering with the Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers to sponsor two of their cleanup days this summer. Um, we are also looking at the Global Sustainability Tourism Council goals to set goals with in, in regards to tourism for Aspen. Um, so that is something that we are just beginning conversations with, but it's really exciting to align those. Accelerating the reduction of the carbon footprint of tourism. There's um, some great work being done here with An Atlantic Aviation offsetting all of the carbon um, emissions out of the Aspen Airport for both commercial and um, private jets. So, um, but just really educating and kind of cataloging all of the alternative experiences and sustainable experiences that our member businesses offer and getting those out into the community and the visitors. Um, there are some recommendations in this plan, I will say, that says to address um, impacts from private jets. And in our conversation with the Picking County Airport, you actually cannot, um, you know, discriminate against private jet versus commercial. So that's just something that's in the plan. But again, because of the realities of being with the restrictions in the U.S., it's not something that we could look into. Improving the visitor and resident experience. This is the first strategy under improve the Aspen experience. And the biggest highlight here, um, I would say, is that um, the recommendation to limit actions to promote off season. This is a pretty big change from um, the director of ACRO was given within the last 10 years, which was not to bring people into the eight peak weeks of summer, but to extend the season into the spring and fall shoulder seasons. And obviously the engagement sessions really heard from the community that there is a desire to protect those off seasons. Um, so we, this is an example of when we would go back to the community and try and define really what that means. So looking at what dates are we looking at? Do we wanna define off season by dates, by um, mountain closures, et cetera, and understand how people want to experience off season. Um, because, for example, if it's all your favorite restaurants are open but no one is in town, that's a different thing than just having a little um, reprieve. Um, also of note is, of course, the Picking County Airport closure, which begins next week, is a natural kind of downtime following the mountain closure. Another recommendation is to diversify our visitor markets. So recommending to stop advertising to luxury and direct fly markets. Um, now this is a little tricky when the price of our hotels are what they are. There is certain luxury associated with that. However, we can market based on values-based targeting, which is a really big movement within the destination marketing world right now. So making sure we're attracting people who are aligned with our community values. Um, and another example of this is the Wheeler Opera House has won a Colorado Tourism Office grant for Historic Opera House's Loop. So we've partnered with them. This is a niche market um, with other historic opera houses around the state. So that's kind of interesting, very niche, um, specific market to historic opera houses within the state of Colorado. So a new market there. Being a catalyst for sustainable choices, um, really working with governments to look at how we can advocate for the phase out of single use uh, plastics. Many obviously businesses have started this line, but I think Aspen has the opportunity to be a leader in this space. And so how can we all work together um, to move, make some movement there? Um, we also know that travelers are looking for voluntourism experiences. So making sure people are aware of what exists um, and making sure we know what all of our member businesses are offering um, in the businesses within the community. What type of volunteerism opportunities can they offer or develop? Because people do want to give back. Finally, redefining visitor economy opportunities. This is definitely something that we have earmarked for a phase three or later in the plan as we wait to see how this geopolitical situation plays out, um, both from an economic standpoint but this is really looking at how we can um, integrate more sustainable tourism type offerings to the visitor base. So engage with 
both business and residents to see what type of experiences they want Aspen to be known for. Something like birding is an example of how you would redefine what type of visitor um, you're trying to attract to the resort. Finally, moving into the preservation of small town character. Um, obviously, advocating for housing crisis solutions, this is a place where we are not going to lead. Um, we're an advocate. <laughs> we're an advocate in this. Um, and again, where ACRA can play a role is providing reliable data for um, short-term rentals. So I spoke to Philip Sapino that we do have some forthcoming data from the transient inventory study that ACRA and Snowmass Tourism and um, SkiCo have partnered with um, providing that about every three years to the community. So that's forthcoming in about two months time and will hopefully assist with any um, decisions that are made around that. And then, of course, with our public affairs group, just continuing to um, advocate for affordable housing as needed. Then again, develop resident ambassador program. This is again something that's a little longer uh, further out in the rollout of the plan, but developing a resident ambassador program. This is really volunteer based. We've seen it done in other destinations. Um, and it would build upon our visitor center staff who meet, greet, meets and greets people at the airport. And it's really providing that visitor with a connection to somebody locally who lives here so they can co communicate the values and what it means to be and visit in Aspen. Um, so it really allows the visitor to have kind of a sense of place. Um, I don't know. Um, so. That's something that's longer lead um, as it would require um, putting some infrastructure into place for educating those people who are interested in becoming residents for or ambassadors for the community. And then along this line where I mentioned that we are also looking into how else to contribute to um, preservation of small town character um, is looking at the formula, your formula retail store um, with CCLC as well as the size of the um, commercial core footprint and just seeing um, if there's any movement there with CCLC being interested in looking at those conversations. Okay. How are you doing? Um, which brings me to um, those are all of the strategies and with this we are working with an agency called BVK who is working to put these, uh, um, create some action with impact based off of these strategies. So as you recall, about 10 years ago, we launched the Defy Ordinary campaign, which was informed by residents um, and their sentiment about Aspen and what it means to be from Aspen. So really coming back to the residents and the community and acknowledging that we heard them um, and that they really informed the pl this plan and that we're taking meaningful steps to um, take action to, to preserve um, small town character, address visitor pressure and enhance the Aspen experience. And just a quick note on the measurement of this, we have engaged destination analysts who is a data company who will be able to look at we will be able to establish a baseline for both visitors and resident sentiment, as well as the um, visitor profile study. So we will be able to measure how our actions have been impacted by this plan. That is the end of the strategies and I'm sure there are many questions. So I'm happy to take those. And Destination Think is still on the line as well if you have questions for them. Thank you. Council members. Can I just ask one kind of guiding question? Of course. It's just how are you guys hoping that we engage with this? Um, are you looking for <clears throat> thoughts? Are you looking for ideas? Are you simply looking for clarifying questions? And this is a one directional. Here's what we're doing. How do you want us to engage? <clears throat> we definitely want you to engage in helping to get some of the strategies, um, you know, in play. So. That looks like everything from, you know, we have this great next step with 
engaging with the short term rental through the permit process that we'll be able to use our visitor education in partnership with your outreach to that. So that's a great example of how we're working together. Um, we'd also, you know, the transportation is a big thing where that is again is a partnership opportunity. So not necessarily um, today we're going to solve that, but you know, I think this is something that because the plan belongs to the community, we're going to continuously be looking to engage um, with the city and the county and skiing company and all the stakeholders in how to further these initiatives. That makes sense. I have a question. I'll be too. I, I had a number of uh, observations, I think, um, one of which is um, that there's a lot of work that's been going on uh, that perhaps you're not aware of. And I would encourage you to make connections with um, environmental health uh, on greenhouse gas um, emissions and how uh, studies have gone on both with uh, environmental health and core uh, and to establish, uh, we have a climate action plan that we've had for quite a long time. So to check in with core and environmental health on those environmental concerns. Um, I know the RAFTA, uh, even at our last board meeting, was, had discussions about uh, valley-wide uh, fare free. Uh, that is, it's, I think, less than 2% of uh, the revenue from RAFTA comes from uh, bus fees. So. Uh, we reduced them once uh, last year and in increased discussion. There was a study done in a pilot program done in Utah that uh, going to fare free uh, increased ridership 16%. So that's certainly something that um, um, ACRA uh, and um, RAFTA and all of us can work on together to increase uh, ridership to get it back to where it was pre-COVID. It's still off by about 25%. Um, I, I can circle back. Uh, have you considered congestion pricing? If you, are you familiar with congestion pricing? Um, on ho Yes, for hotel rooms or for, for traffic? For traffic. Yeah, one of their recommendations actually, um, which I don't think there is, um, interest in here but it would be to tax people coming in over the maroon creek bridge yeah, um, the, the, the upper upper valley mobility study uh, address that quite quite a bit and they will be uh, um, addressing um, the otc retreat this week and i think congestion pricing will come up it's shown it's, it's shown it's been proved to be beneficial in singapore and london and other places so that's that's part of uh, an, part of a plan, transportation plan that should be looked at. Um, what I'm curious is, you know, you have some uh, identified um, Aspen Chamber Resort Association as being an advocate, but I'm wondering what what are you are you at a point where you have advocacy, where you have ideas that you you want to share or are you in the formulative stages on that um, such as uh, preserve and re regenerate uh, national environment and accelerate carbon footprint reduction of tourism how do you how do you want to lead on that what what do you advocate um, well so there's a couple different examples under preserve and regenerate the natural environment we are a funding partner in the maroon bells comprehensive recreation management plan so that is some place where uh, that's a partnership, but um, we're identifying ways to kind of preserve that experience and the natural environment there um, in the Maroon Creek corridor. Um, we have the Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers is something that we are taking a lead on, but again, um, that's just one kind of aspect of preserving and regenerating the natural environment. We've been reaching out to the Aspen Indigenous Foundation um, because it is a big plan recommendation to integrate Indigenous principles into um, our daily life to um, acknowledge their sustainability practices. So also working with nonprofits to incorporate a land acknowledgement in 
before public programs so that we can make that connection to the land. Um, so there's a lot of things at play there that fit under preserving the natural environment. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that you were involved with um, outdoor volunteers. It's been a um, group in existence for a long time. I've done a lot of uh, trail work with them over the years. But there's a lot that can be done. I'm just curious where you are on it. And I have somewhat of a cynical uh, view on tourism. Um, I think that we perhaps are over visited at this point. Um, and I think it was the same group that uh, presented that Iceland might not be right for you. Um, that uh, education is really important that we, uh, that our visitors know what's expected. And I've had a fair amount of uh, interaction with frontline employees in uh, the last couple of years. They've been beat up and they're burned out. And the, 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 um, the idea that if we treat our, our guests kindly, they're going to treat us well, I don't think uh, has proved to be the case. Uh, that uh, they, uh, our guests now are really rude. They're, they're, they're demanding. Uh, and I don't know how to mitigate that, but I, um, I think that it's really burning out some of the front, a lot of the frontline employees to the point of where they're just pulling their hair and saying, I'm out of here. Um, uh, I know a reservationist has been at a place for 14 years. Uh, they're done. They're going to work at the lab. What we can do to retain our local, local workforces is really important. How, how ACRA can fit into that is a, um, a welcome and, and uh, question. I, I wonder how they can fit in, but your efforts are welcome and uh, needed. We did do in October the Frontline Service Appreciation Month um, and went to all of the um, hotels and shops in town with gifts for the employees. So there are certainly efforts that we are taking to acknowledge that. Yeah, so you if you had a month, you, you got a pulse of what's out there. Yes. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot, of sorry. a lot of Paradise Cookies were delivered. Yeah, well, they did. <laughs> a lot of mental health counseling needs to be done too because there's a tremendous amount of stress that has been placed on frontline employees. Um, and under high urgency, high feasibility, you know, there has been a, a really good STR study that um, I think Philip, uh, Haley, 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 yeah, Haley. we met with her today. Yeah, that yeah. is a, a wealth of information there. Uh, um, adopting regional transportation. I mean, RAFT is, is the embodiment of that. Uh, and the free bus system, again, is something that is um, um, in discussions, and I think it's possible. All we need is a little bit of political will on that. I'll yield and start scrolling through some of my other comments, but I know Skippy had some. And I'm sure the rest of you. use. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a few comments. Um, you know, Ward's question, I, I think that part of what's happening is when you pay 50000 a month for a place in Woody Creek or a few thousand a night, you tend to think that the whole town's getting a slice of that and they all owe you something. And we're just not seeing that. And, uh, you know, that <laughs> reference throughout your, your very detailed report. Uh, of um, social inequity and resentment building and things like that. I, I think that um, there I, needs to be I, I a lot think that more. There needs to be a lot into the actions because put what's, into really the actions is, because uh, what's really happening is what's really happening is we want to talk about the quality of life for our residents. Quality of life for our but residents. So but our town or, or some our folks town in our town seem to be dividing that into two types, types of residents. Two types there are of the residents. residents who live in the free there market and the residents who live in the deed restricted. And those in lead in and deed restricted are, are, are hearing the resentment of the business community or others who are saying, how come not everybody, everyone works until they die? How come we don't raise the hours to 2,000 a year, even if your, your business closes for six weeks out of the year? How come we don't have just a rental only program 
that uh, this whole idea that our housing program is supposed to sustain a community and have children and seniors, you know, we're wasting bedrooms. They could be workers, low income workers. And, you know, the premise is out there with some people now that we should start prioritizing job types so that we can pick and pan the type of people we want. And whatever the chamber is doing to try to address some of these issues, it's, 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 uh, its voice is drowned out by the louder voices who like to say that Aspen's workers and their affordable housing somehow are taking advantage of the community, the program. They don't deserve to have children and bedrooms for children. Why, why, why can they even retire in their units? Why can they pass their unit along to their working child to inherit? And I, I think that if the chamber doesn't step up and start taking the side of the workers and talk about the value of the workers to the chamber and to this community, um, th this level of resentment is not gonna decrease. And it, it's in the papers uh, every other day or emails I'm getting from people every other day challenging uh, why we have a program that's about sustaining community instead of just a program that's about supplying temporary and transient workers at low cost. And, you know, I've been here for 40 years and I've known some employers, many employers who've been here that whole length of time. And I've known a very small handful who've invested in their employees enough for them to buy housing or for them to use some of their, their business to invest in housing. And there was always a safety valve of, oh, sheriff's deputies are buying up in Missouri Heights. They can't do that anymore. They can't buy anywhere in this valley. And suddenly the turn is just looking at the, the people who've lived in the worker housing saying, why aren't you working a third job? Why aren't you solving our staff shortages? And APSHA is never going to do that. I mean, we don't even see county participation at a reasonable level. There is no uh, taxes collected towards affordable housing at the airport business center on top of the ski hills or anywhere throughout the valley, uh, picking county in general. And yet the turn is always to the city of Aspen to say, what are you doing about our immediate need for workers? And I, I'd love to see the chamber talking more to the county about their role in this issue, as well as the city. Uh, when I see terms like advocate for free buses, I, I'd like to know what funding source you're advocating for. And I know Ward's a little closer to it than I am in terms of what revenue is generated for RAPTA so far. But I will tell you, I sat in on executive committee meeting with Club 20 on Friday with Carrie Kennedy working on issues under the state house. And she said there's over 14 ballot initiative titles have already been pulled and groups are working on those to offer a cap on property taxes similar to Proposition 13 in California, so that you know there's a 3% cap on what you could be reassessed every year, but if your house value goes up 10%, well, that new value just isn't taxed anymore. And over 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, it gets to where the existing residents are only taxed on 40% of their home value, and someone new trying to move into community pays the full truck. And so that means that organizations like RAFTA that will depend on their property tax or our own government are going to be very limited in the revenues that we receive to deal with any community services or issues. At they're, they're talking revenue caps, plus caps on how much assessment value can go up so that if a government is experiencing 5% increase with cost of employees and 5% increase with the cost of materials to provide those services, but your income is capped at 3% appreciation a year, services will steadily and consistently decline. And you'll see a rafter that's well-funded today as a property tax start to be very limited by that. So I'm just saying we have facing a lot of financial issues across the board. I don't know if any of those measures will pass. They're all being workshopped right now and tested with focus groups to see which appeals most to all the residential voters of Colorado to say, your property taxes can never go up more than 2% a year from here on out. And think about what that do to the school district or other districts, their citizen initiative type of proposals are coming forward. So our state legislature is thinking about preempting them and going ahead and 
doing something to limit any future increases for property taxes. Um, I don't like taxes increasing, but I also don't like cutting services because we no longer receive the revenues to do basic street repairs. And those are the types of things we're going to face from this side. Uh, Rachel, can I ask one question to understand what you're saying? If I could continue, Skippy, I, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'm just saying that things that we've depended on and thought that were really fully or well-funded because of they were funded by a dedicated property tax, there's essentially an effort to rebruce those and to tag them to some number well below inflation and, and just make it an arbitrary money number statewide. Okay. And those would be citizen initiative. Um, but there's a multiple of those coming down the line right now that really will affect the operation of government at any level. Uh, I, I am very concerned. I'd love to see ACRA taking a bigger role in advocating for that sustainable community and for the workers within this community. Uh, it, it just hasn't been happening so far. And um, people are, are more than burnt out. I mean, it's just adding up the days. and. Uh, Everyone's getting ready for Memorial Day weekend. That's like 36 days away. <laughs> you know, you barely have time to clean your businesses, let alone the remodeling that needs to be done or trying to shift people in and out for vacations or things like that. It, th th there is no off season anymore. There's a few businesses that get to shut down, but most businesses are doing cleaning, remodeling, reordering, putting away winter. Uh, it, it just isn't as if it exists. But uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the quality of life. I, I see a lot of good things in your report. I, I'm glad to see the uh, desire for more pedestrian orientation and bicycle downtown. And I'd love to see you advocating for some changes to occur at the entrance to Aspen and congestion pricing or tolling on the entrance. I think that's the only long-term solution to dealing with these matters. And, and these are starting to be under active conversations. So uh, I think what I'm really hoping to find is that there's more real solid actions in coming out of this than, than laudable goals. Because I, I, I don't know, there's a lot of locals, if you got their storytelling happening, wouldn't necessarily be inviting people to town. And there's a lot of ambassadors that would not necessarily say, hey, this is the greatest place since sliced bread. Uh, we've got our own issues here. And so I, 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 I have seen, and I'm sure we all have seen, where uh, the state legislature did pass the ability for communities to ask, can they repurpose their tourism tax into things more like housing? And I'd love to see the Chamber of Commerce say, we have a program to develop one housing unit a year out of our budget or, ha or units for your own employees. And set an example for the business community of, of going out and, and securing your own housing as opposed to turning to government to deliver numbers it's never going to be able to deliver. We're never going to reproduce the working class that Aspen had before the booms or that the Valley used to support. The average single family home prices, a $3,000 brand new three bedroom rental in Carbondale, that's not going to support half of the workers that we have and need. And um, that's, that's uh, so I, I just don't know where we go from advocating you know, without saying what money we're advocating for, you know, or, or how to use it or what pot it comes out of. A and that's the challenge I have with this. So you guys have a lot of work to do. We do, and I, I would like to say that maybe it didn't come across, but a lot of these things are in action right now. So the entire ACRA staff is supporting the recommendations out of this plan. As mentioned, it's a five-year plan, so not everything is going to be executed against this year. Um, but I can assure you everything from advocacy with the public affairs group in the transportation and housing realm. We're in touch with Carolyn Tucker on workforce development and the, the ability to kind of provide long-term career growth within the Valley. I mean, there, there is quite a lot that ACRA is involved in, and if I didn't portray that correctly during the presentation, that's my bad, but there is a lot of action happening within the chamber to execute against the strategies that are beyond kind of aspirational goals, that it's actually kind of boots on the ground getting to the work. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And again, I guess I just really would love to see ACRA really be an advocate 
for year-round residents and, and, and people year-round within this program and that we are a sustainable community. Uh, you know, I, uh, the, the ongoing attacks against uh, seniors or people who haven't moved out yet, um, not by ACRA, but by the community, uh, need a, a powerful group like ACRA to stand up for it. Uh, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Thank I you. I hear you. There is quite a lot of toxic negativity in the community, and they just you know, and the, the workforce takes it to heart. They take it. That was me. That was me. They're talking about that I'm not worth being here, or my 40 years so far should just evaporate. It was never appreciated. It's resented actually, because someone else wants my place. You know, it, it, this is getting ugly. Rachel. John? Um, more of an observation than a question, but to me, one of the most important things on your list of priorities is accelerating reduction of the carbon footprint of tourism and why that isn't instituted until phase three um, bothers me a little bit. Uh, I, th I think it should be a main focus. Um, so I think part of the phasing was given to us by Destination Think, and then we reserve the right to implement as we can activate on it. And some of the things are like phase three would be a completion. So there are items in this, like establishing a metric to improve upon from within that reducing the carbon footprint tourism that we're working on right now. And part of that is working with the Global Sustainability Tourism Council. Um, those criteria are informed by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we are working on that actively to kind of get our foot in the door there. So it's not something that we've put off um, for phase three. And, you know, um, in a way where Rachel referenced ACRA leading by example, we are now offsetting all ACRA staff trips through the Good Traveler. Um, ACRA is going to pay for that. ACRA is also um, donating a comp day for us to volunteer with Roaring Fork off Outdoor Volunteers. So there are um, ways in which ACRA is kind of trying to lead by example. I guess part of my question slash observation was, you know, it, it's a five-year plan, and I see there's three phases, but I see no dates. And so that uh, vagueness is something I think about. Thanks, John. Come back down the line, Skippy. Sure. Um, first, thank you guys. A ton of work. Um, a, a lot went into this, and I think the presentation conveys the clarity and the dedication um, and the thoughtfulness that you guys have, have put into this. It just it reads it reads super well, and I really. Thank you uh, for that up front. Um, all right, so a bit scattershot. You'll have to go with me on this journey. There's a bunch of notes. Um, you know, the, the first thing, uh, I'll knock off the important one, you talk about housing um, and being an advocate for it. One, I celebrate that fully. I'd love to see you guys step into a stronger advocacy role um, in whatever way that means to you. Uh, I think that will benefit all of us. Um, but certainly in my experience in speaking to employers, without, uh, <laughs> uh, without exception, if I stop and actually speak to an employer and ask about the housing situation, it's a disaster, it's killing the business, et cetera. Follow-up question being, have you uh, participated in any of our you know, city survey? Are you part of the moratorium? No, right? Um, Almost always, it's a, it's a no. There's a feeling that I've I've had transmitted to me of futility, or just it. They're so overwhelmed they can't get to it. Um, but it seems to me that you guys are in the perfect position to be a gatherer of that information, of that experience. Do people need housing? Do they not? For whom? For what type of employee? Um, what type of housing would they advocate for? It's been said here, and I agree, we can't do this on our own. We're gonna need better partnership from our business community, financially and otherwise. What would that look like? Um, so, you know, whether it's a six month or a year, an annual, some sort of report that comes back to us so that we make sure we're taking into account all of our business community, I think would be really helpful. Um, 
Allison, I don't know if you want to say to speak to the policy statements, but we did um, engage with the board, which are business owners, regarding housing as well as the short-term rental. Um, so we have data collected from that, and they, the board has formed policy statements on both of those topics. I don't know if there's more to say. Yeah, and I don't, I don't need an answer yeah, right okay. now. It's just I appreciate the focus, and that's sort of my experience of where, where at least one area I know you guys could be helpful, and if there's a way to sort of institutionalize and make that a, a regular thing so that when someone comes up to me on the street and says, how's the business community doing with housing, I have, a, I have a, an informed answer. I think that's a really great place for, for ACRA. If it's a way, Skippy, we're just finalizing those policy statements on where we stand on housing, transportation, um, Eliza has alluded Debbie, to. you need to be at a microphone oh, yeah, for gonna... grassroots. And then, and then when you do, you have to like speak into it as if you're. Nothing, just forget what <laughs> no, I'm... come up. But you're gonna have more things to say. I know as I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do the green and the red, right? Thank you, Debbie Braun, Aspen Chamber. Skippy, you must be reading our minds because since January, we just did a very extensive member survey and we mimicked what council is working on and we asked the business community and the business community plus the employees. So the survey broke in two different ways. One if you were an employee, one if you were a business. Um, we found some consensus but in our community, there's long-held beliefs on certain things so that are not true. They're not what our businesses are telling us. So we called those the sticky subjects. So we've been looking at the stickies to figure out, digging deeper into the data so we can show that actually potentially daycare is not driving people out of the valley like people believe it is. The survey's telling us it's not. So it's little things like that. We're just about done with it. We just had our last public affairs meeting last week. We will have published policy statements on all of these topics. Nice and um, transportation and housing are two that we're peeling out of the destination management plan and putting with the public affairs committee, which is about 12 business owners that um, are members of ACRA. So that group is meeting and they're digging a little bit deeper on those subjects. Advocacy is a tricky word. We're like, oh, are we educating? Are we advocating? But for those two, housing and transportation, we know that we have to take a stronger role as a partner or an advocate. So TBD, I think it's really great that we just are acknowledging that that's an area that the community wants and wants to see us move into. That's so, awesome. I, yeah, I so, so we will get all that to you, actually, as soon as we finish it up. That's Those great. policy statements. I appreciate that. And, and all I, the data. I think you're a data guy, too, right? Uh, all, all the above. Data and fields. Bring them in. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I appreciate that. I look forward to that. And uh, as you sort of stand on that fulcrum between advocacy and education, I know that historically it has been on one side of that teeter-totter. But I, I, would, I would encourage you guys to take ownership. I think advocacy is needed and I think you're a good uh, position for it. And if the fear is that that would alienate you to some part of the community, uh, I certainly don't think it would be here. You're giving us information. We choose what to do with it. So I appreciate that. Um, OK, turning to item two. So you know, we, it's in the report. Everyone's alluding to it or talking about it directly. But just sort of this energy shift in, in town amongst the tourist base and otherwise. I know as a frontline worker, I have certainly observed it firsthand. Um, and I, I think it's really uh, at the core of what we need to figure out over the coming years. And you know, there's, a, there's several things that could be causing it, and we really don't know what it is, right? Uh, in some sense, it could simply be the result of the reallocation of, of stress and anxiety of COVID. And if so, what we need to do is find ways to return to normal to alleviate that and return there. It could be the result of general changes in our culture driven by Instagram, right? We want to be seen being places rather than being in the places. Um, if so, then like you said, targeted marketing, how do we uh, avoid marketing to that sort of crowd? Well, probably don't do it on Instagram, right? Um, it might be a socioeconomic thing, right? We all know that there are people of very uh, meager means and very high means who are amazing heart-centered people and vice versa. We're not painting with a broad brush. Um, but maybe it just is that the more dollars per minute you spend here, people are going to be more rude and entitled. I don't know. Um, but it strikes me that we need to figure that out. 
And it strikes me from this report that you guys are pretty well versed at getting feedback. And so I wonder what sort of partnership you might be able to offer in you know coming back in a year from now and saying, hey, th this is what's kind of underlying this. Um, and how can we work together on strategies to mitigate for it? I think that's pretty easy because we'll be working on that 360 degree feedback all year. So one of the things we learned is we can't just ask people every 10 years what they think. Um, and certainly with COVID, um, it's, I think we're still in, I still sometimes feel shock or PTSD from the work that everybody had to do during COVID. Yeah. So I think PTSD, we're, it's sort of waning a little bit and now we're trying to reacclimate. Um, so we will be talking to employees and um, residents through some online technology that Eliza's working with. What about visitors though? Because it seems to me that only knowing half of that conversation can't give you a result. Well, we do talk to visitors every day at the four visitor centers. So, I Hi. mean, we've got the boots on the ground every day hearing from that group of people. I think we're intermixing a couple things here, um, which is new residents and visitors, mm -hmm. and those have kind of gone. Um, we, we need to segment them out a little bit, um, but Eliza, do you have anything to add? Well, part of the work that Destination Analysts is going to do is the visitor profile and visitor sentiment survey. So they will be interviewing people who have come to visit Aspen in the past six months. Um, so we have the ability to see were your expectations met by paying $50,000 for a month? Uh, maybe not. So maybe there is this, this conflict happening because man, that we haven't managed expectations accurately. Right. Well, and um, it's that, like, so there's a role for us to play there. Yeah, and it's the confluence of that data of like, you know, say my experience in the vacation rental space and how I'm observing behavior of guests, but then what is the guest expectation? Why are they here, et cetera, that like within that is sort of the alchemy of that real core question. So that's awesome. I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to that. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to say to people, we're working on figuring it out. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, in terms of sort of engaging and shifting that, you mentioned a couple things that I wanted to dig into. Um, you know, in my mind, um, despite what Ward said about we can't kind people into behavior, we can't guarantee we can kind people into behavior, but we can kind people into behavior. Like, like we know biologically, sociologically, we are wired to mirror what other people present. And so the, you know, I, the ambassador program seems like a great start, um, dropping little bits of sort of, you know, delight and happiness and that into the experience. Um, but I, I just wonder about a, a broader role for ACRA in that. You know, we've talked about up here, like the, the physical design of our city, you know, as you, uh, as we put up a new bus stop, right, are there like, little messages of goodwill or little games people can play with one another. Yeah, let's think about the armory, not the bus stop. Sure, yeah, yeah but, but all of it. that's visitor experience, yeah, yep. that we're really thinking about. And, and in wayfinding, I know some of you talk about, so you know, I wonder if there's an opportunity for sort of that virtual ambassador in the physical space that you guys can help us work through in any number of projects to really inject some of that delight into the, the experience. Yeah, we had a great meeting with High Mountain Taxi today about just some QR codes and how we can get the Aspen Pledge in front of everybody right away when they're in the cab. So trying to find different ways to connect with audiences. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love that. And I'd love to like, you know, have you guys talk to, you know, us or staff about how sort of that can integrate with our own kind of workflow up here around a variety of projects from mental health to physical developments to the armory um, because, you know, we could use that sort of extra eyes and ears on how to better each each project. Um, I think that would be would be really cool. Um, let me see here. I've done that. Oh, just the other, this is sort of a, just a guiding comment, but, you know, educational strategies is the word. I get it. It's different for tourists and second, new second homeowners. We talk about it all the time. It is necessary. When we talk about it as educating someone, it can feel quite patronizing to the receiver. <laughs> um, so I just want to be mindful Cheeky that we're fun. like sharing or sharing our experience um, with them uh, is just a way to sort of break through that because, you know, to Rachel's point about the like affordable housing local who feels 
unwanted, impinged upon, like ready to leave. Like I get it. Like I've felt that way during the last couple of years. I, everyone I know has. It's also true that second homeowners who live in million dollar homes feel that way. I mean, I, I talked to some today you, that no one would ever put in that camp, but it is sort of a universal feeling right now. And so being bridge builders uh, as much as educators, I think is. Yeah, it's really about looking at the community holistically that each of those parts yeah. play a role into making the whole. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the, the pledge is one way that kind of allows everybody to kind of um, reflect on that, you know, what it means to be from here, but also we want to share that with you, yeah. um, either as a new resident or as a visitor. So really, to your point, kind of bridge building. Um, and inviting people into the fold. Um, so it's more of a local's yeah. tip versus uh, here's how you need to do this. Um, that's, that's right, and I, I, mean, I think back to when I was a you know, tourist coming here, the reason I, like I loved it so much more than home, it felt more like home than the home I left um, because I was always greeted as if I was part of the community. And so I wanted to respond and act as if I was a member of the community. And so I think with new individuals, that's a really big opportunity. Um, the second piece you talked about in, in sort of targeting is developing experiences. Um, and and I, I noticed that there, there wasn't, or at least I, I missed if there wasn't, um, talk about sort of the event schedule, right? I mean, it seems to me the most intentional way we can decide who our tourist of today, which is also known as the resident of tomorrow, is through those events. And we all know a banker's conference feels different than Coachella. So, you know, <laughs> can we can we really give a look to, yeah. yeah. Speak I'm to that? really yeah. glad you brought that up because one of the strategies to enhancing the Aspen experience is that ACRA has decided to not produce the Aspen Arts Festival, um, which traditionally took place at the end of July because that was not adding value to the community. Um, it's not a need period, and um, you know, it, in the end, it's not something that's serving residents or visitors. So that's an example, and we've eliminated an event from our production schedule. Yeah. That, that's in response great. to the plan. Great, and not just great because we eliminated, but just because we're getting more targeted. I mean, the economy will bring whomever it brings. Instagram's gonna bring whomever it brings, but we can choose those who we want. Certainly, you know, if we want to focus on DEI, like the National Brotherhood event, whether Acker brought it or not, very successful at bringing that audience, right? And so I think, I, I just appreciate that. Um, last, just two comments are, uh, you know, walkable city. Um, uh, Huge, huge proponent here, not just because of the, the experiential mental health community benefit, but if we can reclaim streets in the downtown core, we've freed up community-owned square footage for all the things that we say we want, like local business, parks connective space. So I wondered if, if you guys had a flushed out idea of what a walkable and cycling city means to you, and if not, how you might arrive at it. There are some good examples that I can send over um, that relate to that recommendation from Destination Think. So I can share those with you. That'd be great. And yeah. as Rachel said, during the you know ETA entrance to Aspen conversation, I think is a great time because in my mind, like these two things are inextricably linked. If we want to have a, a pedestrian downtown core, well, we have to solve a way to keep cars outside of town in an enjoyable way. And so um, I hope you guys are on that conversation sooner than later. Um, oh, and then this is just a comment that really doesn't need response. The, the shift of we want our off seasons guarded, I feel that, and I used to be a fill in the off season person, um, so I've flip flopped on that, so to speak. It's not a good indicator. It, it's not that we've changed our mind. It's that the on season used to be awesome, and so we were like, let's have more of that, please. Now the off season kind of sucks, and so we're like, oh, we need to maintain our own time. And so, like, I do think we need to respond to that in the moment and preserve what we have. But success will look like when people want to fill in the off seasons again because we've put in a, a series of experiences that make the on seasons desirable and enjoyable. So, okay, I think also like, just on that note is that um, you know Acra will not promote off season this spring, but private enterprise like hotels are going to continue to do so. I promise you it's going to be busier. Yeah, so, um, you know, we may find that ACRA's role is to educate to those people when they are here. So yeah. instead of external facing internally, um, you know, geo-fenced geo right. type education messages. 
while Aspen's a mature destination, we say Snowmass is still building. So while we stopped marketing, Snowmass Tourism is in a full court press. So one of the educational pieces is like, how does that all, how do we all work together in the tourism space? Mm -hmm. um, because they've got different stakeholders who say, get them in. And we know X amount of dollars is actually spent in Aspen, or for every dollar they say over 50 cents is spent in Aspen, because that then contributes to the traffic. Um, so ACRA can't solve everything. We, we just, we acknowledge that. And what we're trying to do is with the tax dollars that we do receive from the lodging through the city contract is to do, be the best stewards with that money that we can be. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for all the great work. I'm looking forward to Thank the results you. of it all. Yeah. Thank you. If, if I could circle back with a couple of uh, fill in the pieces. Uh, first of all, um, in the last two or three years have been really stressful because of the amount, how dynamic it's been. Um, and the mountain migration report, I think, really identifies that. I am so appreciative of ACRA changing from trying to get people in here to focusing more on a sustainable um, community. Um, I know this is a new role for, for ACRA. Um, I, I think that um, perhaps you um, don't take offense in this, but I think you're behind the curve on some of these things because it's new to you. Um, but I, I really welcome the engagement uh, of of the whole ACRA community towards a sustainable community because uh, we need that more now than we need more tourists. Um, I, I, I think you were there at uh, CCLC when Formula Retail uh, came up mm -hmm. and uh, that ties into um, affordable tourism and um, in a, there was some place in, uh, in the report that talked about uh, more affordable uh, um, Eclectic and local shops. Yeah, local yes. shops. And <clears throat> my, my note that I made on it, it it's not going to happen with the rent as high as it is. So there, uh, my, an observation I had is that it's um, the accelerated change that we've seen in the last couple yeah. of years. It, first of all, it takes us a while to realize that this change has taken place. And once we realize it, then it's like we feel um, a feeling of acting too slowly, like we're closing the, the barn door after the, the horse has already escaped. But um, it's, it's better to stop digging uh, and um, to close the door while there's still, if we don't try, if we don't attempt to mitigate and to uh, address these problems, we're certainly going to fail. Uh, I don't think, I think realistically we're not going to reach the goal that we want to. but trying is uh, is what we all have to do and I welcome the partnership here because there are a lot of organizations that are um, have decades ahead start on some of the stuff that you're now focusing on because you you're you're, you're doing a pivot to uh, uh, instead of attracting tourists to um, maintaining a, a sustainable uh, community and that's I think what this council has a strong um, a desire to do. Um, I noticed on one that Aspenites are committed to preserving the the small town character. Um, I, I question that. I think that there are a lot of people that are more concerned with making a profit than they are in uh, preserving the character of the town. And that money uh, is an aphrodisiac, and it has your hubris uh, and avarice has to be contained and. Um, uh, we have to, as a community, focus on that. Um, and I don't know if we can control or mitigate in migration. It's a changing time. Uh, migration report certainly identifies that. Uh, what we can do about it, I don't know, but we have to try. Um, and I want to echo what I think uh, Skippy and, and Rachel both said, that I would love to see ACRA be contributing money towards workforce housing for your employees um, and uh, contributing to, to that effort as well. Yeah, I don't know how we get back to a more affordable tour, uh, tourism base, but 
uh, without trying, we're, we're not going to get there. So thank you. Thank you for uh, um, joining in this fight. Well, thank you, Ward. And I just want to say that while we represent 725 member businesses right now, that's our, our membership count, and it's actually stronger than it's ever been before. So we came out of COVID and more members joined. I think they saw the advantage of the convening and the educating that we were doing. But to be quite honest with you, the membership splits very frequently right in half. So I want you to understand that while we support our management plan, the education that we have is really for our own. Is And it's kind of what you talked about with the money and that getting, you know, is it money or is it community? So we're, you know, leaning on the board, we're leaning on our committees, we're leaning on our members to get as many people educated as to why maybe not marketing in off season is the right thing to do, even though intuitively it might feel like it's wrong to the business. So we have our hands full. And I, I thank you for acknowledging that, but we're going to keep doing it. You know, one business, one person at a time. So that I don't misinterpret your comments, yeah. when you arrive at those frequent splits of membership, mm -hmm. how would you describe that split? What? Well, one example <laughs> is the off season, right? There's yeah. some people that want year round employment to pay the rent. And then there's the split that would like to preserve the off season. So that's like a tricky balance there. Um, and oftentimes hoteliers could facilitate it by lessening the staff and giving certain people time off. But, you know, trying to find that balance to, you know, where is the break point? I, I could say it could be housing. It could be transportation. Well, it could no, just no, I be understand just there's about, a variety yeah. of issues, but like, is there a... No, they break almost 50-50, 48-52 on, just on almost anything any and everything. issue. And is there yeah. a difference in base, uh, base outcome desires or base value that, that facilitates that? Like Potentially value. Yeah. I'll say no more. <laughs> okay. But that's our job then to whichever way we decide we're going because it's right for the community in the opinion of the plan, our job will to help bring, um, bring along the other part of the membership that maybe didn't initially agree with that. It's a whole new world out there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so just a few comments from me. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's been amazing to see uh, ACRA's uh, development over the last couple of years. Um, uh, I've been uh, uh, watching and working with ACRA for almost 20 years now. And, um, you know, what you did lent to the pandemic and leadership in that time and uh, community communication and advocacy and stuff was amazing. And then for this, this next phase of uh, destination management instead of marketing, um, you know, if any of us had talked about this 10 years ago, I don't think we would have seen that we would be here right now like this. So uh, compliments to you, Debbie, obviously, because you've been a, a leader of this organization for a while, and through these changes, you were really the leader, but also your entire staff. Yes. I mean, they're doing things outside of what their maybe conceived roles were going to be at ACRA, and it's, it's just been um, really great to see everybody succeeding so well. Well, I would like to point out that Allison's new title is Public Affairs Manager, and we really are now putting a staff person behind more, I, we don't like to call it advocacy because we're a chamber and we don't want to do that, but really more in that role of um, these types of issues that we've been talking about today, actually put a staff person along with the committee together. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and then on Destination Think, I think this uh, organization's done a great job for you as well, um, a, a great choice. I, I like a lot of what I see in the presentation. Um, only two comments from me. Um, you know, one, I, I still, I, I get fearful that it's a, it's a um, different packaging on marketing. I don't necessarily feel that all the time, but mm -hmm. um, as this has evolved, it, I've always had that a little bit where I'm like, you know, are we still really talking about just a different kind of marketing? And um, I, I feel it less and less, but I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, because again, that's what these people do, really. <laughs> Well, ultimately, we will have to market that management strategy of education, right? I, I can't just put together educational tools and hope that somebody's going to decide to look on the website. So, you know, there will be 
a marketing element to management. Yeah, but I, I don't mean just marketing this planning and such, but pl marketing Aspen, if you will. So, uh, but nonetheless, I, I just wanted to share that with you as a comment. Um, and then the only thing that I would add as an additional or my input here would be um, maybe some more um, uh, bullet points, focus points around employee support. Great. Um, you know, it was mentioned mental health, um, but, you know, if, if there's a role for ACRA to really be engaging those frontline workers and keeping them connected, keep, making them feel a sense of the, of the belonging that, that we kind of talked a little bit maybe yeah. uh, is diminishing. But that's the only really additive that I would say is that if we're talking about that uh, destination management is, is, is some attention to the frontline workers and making them uh, feel that connectedness to Aspen, that they are valued and that they are Aspen. Um, that's really the only thing that I would add to you. Thank you. That's great. That's good. I got one more thing. Skippy? Sorry. Uh, uh, I know. I got to watch that link. So Is I this the only thing that's on. going on and we're done when we're done? <laughs> oh, yeah. I wish that was the case. <laughs> Just checking. Um, you know, Ward kind of made that, that offhand comment about, you know, will, will affordability uh, ever come back? Will, will you know, local business ever come back? I, I know all of us have the desire for it. Um, it, it strikes me as uh, it, it certainly can. It, it had, certainly has in other places. Um, this is not an unsolved problem. You know, I think about affordable, delicious food. I think Singapore is arguably the best food city in the world. And although it is one of the most expensive cities in the world, right? I mean, the, the per capita income is higher than the U.S. You want to buy and license a Honda Civic, you're paying 120 grand. But I can go get a like a world-class bowl of noodles or anything for four bucks. Um, they created micro spaces that service, you know, solopreneurs who focus on their tasks on public space that's rent controlled. And it is a total home run. Um, cities like Tokyo, most expensive city in the world, quite possibly, but there are districts that you go to, which is where everyone wants to go, no matter how rich or poor, that have tiny little storefronts that do all kinds of incredible things that are very characterful, local, delicious, and affordable. So it just strikes me there's a lot of cities that have figured this out. It's certainly not with the, uh, outside the scope of our ability, yeah. but it, it may be really helpful because you are of the business community to um, help us see like what is possible, what's being done elsewhere, how would the business community feel if it meant some kind of transition, how can we manage that in a way that existing local business, the few of them that are left, don't protest it out of fear of unfair advantage, but embrace it? Because eventually we protest to the point where there's zero people left. And is that really when we want to make that change, when it's too late? Right? It's not. So that strikes me as a, a, a really clear place for you guys to get involved that I would greatly appreciate. Thank you. I'm not in charge, but he's got his hand up. <laughs> yeah. I also just wanted to, to uh, thank you guys for changing your direction. And uh, I like all the, dea all the ideas you came up with, and obviously a lot of work went into it. Thanks. Thank you. I, I was hoping to make one comment about the public engagement, uh, the 1,299 surveys we got back from city and county. And you mentioned, Skippy, maybe you know we've got this good outreach. Um, I continue to get surveys from the city, and you, you're asking people to log in and get a username and a password, and I have more people call me and say, not doing it. Nope, nope. One -click world. So uh, I feel like we have a look. Ours was open, so anyone and everyone, and then we fixed it on the back end, anything, if people um, did anything strange in there, like voted 50, 60 times. But I, I, you know, somebody just wanted to call us because they got an email about the armory. And they said it took three clicks to get to the place where I could go make a comment. And then I got stopped there with the sign up. So, uh, you know, in communicating, I, I said I'd promise I'd tell somebody. Uh, no, I, I appreciate it. And I'm sure our staff would love to. I, I think there's a reason for it. Like, I'm sure you guys I'm are doing it for a reason, but it seems to be inhibiting um, people. So I, I'm sure it is. I don't know what that reason is. I'm sure our staff would talk to you. But anything yeah. we could do to improve participation, right? I mean, sometimes we just forget that it is a one-click world. And it's so easy for us to be dismissive and be like, well, if they didn't show up, then they didn't care enough. But like, that's actually not helping us make good policy. So if there's well, opportunities for improvement, we should be receptive to that. 
what I worry about is that only one group is pushing out emails for the armory. Mm -hmm. um, so the feedback you're getting is from the group that signed in and doing it. There's other people who would like to participate and maybe we can work with Allison or do something on our side as well for the armory, but um, to get more feedback into City Mall. I'm, I'm sure yeah. our staff would love to hear any ideas for yeah. improvement. For sure. So. Yeah. I'd just like to say in closing that I realize um, each one of you is walking a tightrope with a mixed board and a mixed community. It's very hard to, to say, no, we have to be this way or that way when you have that mix. But the question of whether uh, Aspen's affordable housing program is for a sustainable long-term community, generation to generation, or just needs to be designed to provide transient one or two season workers, that, that's a debate that's happening in our community. It has long-term impacts. I, I, I can't imagine, you know, one third or, or more of the dollars that have created housing have come from people taking out private mortgages. And they're often taking out mortgages, at least prior to the recent uh, short-term period, where their, their mortgage interest payments are higher than their appreciation they can receive on their house as it's capped yeah. at, at 3%. And um, it, it's just become a challenge when people say, oh, oh you have an empty bedroom. Uh, you know, maybe you're hoping your child is going to come back from college and live with you for a little bit. Or maybe they do off and on through the years. And it, it's just become this, uh, the people in affordable housing are bad, <laughs> you know, and yeah, you know, kind of attitude. They're taking advantage of a system that was set up by all of us to sustain a community and not necessarily about always having the cheapest and ready workforce for every business in town. And uh, that has become the pressure, I think, that we're feeling and that APCHA is feeling and others are feeling because of uh, the changing dynamics in the valley as a whole. You know, you try to find a home in Glenwood Springs and it's uh, $500,000 for 700 square feet somewhere. And, and that's the dynamic that I think a lot of our business community has not realized the uh, good paying and interesting jobs that are now in the Mid Valley and Lower Valley and not having the commute. And the, uh, the, the wage difference is not that much anymore, especially when you consider a lower cost of living for, for yourself and your family. And the greater amenities, you know, when people can live in the Mid Valley or those who bought earlier and still could afford it, they can get a backyard, they can have a dog, they can have all these things. And people in affordable housing generally can't have most of those things. Right. And, and, and you know, people are, why do they need a closet that big for all their ski gear? We could pack more units in if everybody could just live in 300 square foot each, you know? And I'm just, it, it's just maybe I'm feeling that pressure more than others do, but I, I really hear it from so many community members now that, that you know, they don't know if they made a good bargain trying to be a permanent citizen here. And I don't know how many restaurants want to retrain a new executive chef every 12 months because they can't stay here longer and, and, or that they don't want to or they realize I'm never going to have equity in this community. I can't, I can't have equity in this community. Why should I build my life and my career here? And, and that's the issue we need to confront. Well, thank you. I'm not talking to the same people you're talking to. I'm not hearing affordable housing is bad or they need to go. I'm not hearing any of those conversations. So I'm going to actually tune in to that dial for you and for myself. There's a particular um, Because I have channel. many of our employees are in free market and affordable. Yeah. Um, but the, the affordable housing isn't workforce housing altogether we're building community yeah. so uh, you know that's what i think there we're it's all important yeah. um and i'll leave it up to you guys to figure out what the right mix is but um i haven't heard anybody um be disparaging businesses anyway towards the affordable housing program when i do hear it it seems like i hear carbondale and glenwood say take care of your own problem like i hear the elected mid down say stuff like that but i i haven't heard it from the business owners but we're going to get that housing info that with the survey we did and we'll just make sure to get all that info to you guys as well great thank yeah. you tori is there public comment on the housing strategic plan tomorrow um i think it's in our action items actually it's action items 
well, not at the meeting then, but the, the housing strate strategic yeah. plan, which I'm super proud of. Uh, it does call out, you know, community as being the goal along with workforce in there. Um, so closest thing to a one click in this process would be to support that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank you Thank guys. You. Thank you. I'll see you in the morning, 830. Will you be there? <laughs> Police department? Yes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Handcuffed. Ready to be tased. Oh, what's happening? Are you getting tased again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Going to an ACRA board meeting feels like you can taste, right? Too much. Um, <laughs> thank you, guys. The papers are wondering now. <laughs> There's no tasing going um, on Thank you, there. Grassroots. That's our work session this evening. We're back tomorrow at 5 o'clock with a regularly scheduled meeting, so public comment at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Do that again, right?